Good morning, Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to United Israel World Union. This is our Sabbath morning scripture study coming to you live from St. Francisville. Thank you so very much for joining us today. Um, I do want to say thanks to Dr. Tabor for covering for me in my absence last week. Now, I think I saw that someone has already shared this document. This document is something that I put together uh, for the study today. We're going to go through this, uh, not word for word. I'm not going to read every bit of it. Uh, I don't think I will. But it gives you something to study, to carefully examine. You will understand more about this document as we get into today's class. Today's class, <clears throat> this is week number 22 in our ongoing study, uh, the Pentateuch, A New Look. We're working through the text of the Pentateuch, the five books, according to the annual cycle of readings. This week on the calendar, according to the annual cycle of readings, is what we call reading Kitisa. Kitisa begins in Exodus chapter 30, verse 11, and runs all the way through chapter 34, verse 35, Kitisa. Now, there's a lot of interesting things in Kitisa, and I could have taught on any number of parts of that reading, but I decided early in the week, in fact, it even hit me last weekend when I was away, to begin to focus a little bit for this week's class on one element, one story, one narrative within Torah reading, Ki Tisa. And I decided that the best way to do that would be to sort of do what we did a few weeks ago and do a comparative study, what I've called horizontal reading, because you can look at a story that appears in one place in the five books and totally miss other data, other information that is only supplied in a similar story that's found somewhere else in the Pentateuch. Now, I want to say going into this that we're going to be looking closely at these accounts that are similar. We're going to be looking for two things. We're going to be looking for similarities between the two accounts, but we're also going to be looking for differences. And I think that together, these give us a better opportunity to get at what actually happened. So we're going to be doing that today. It's sort of a tedious thing, and that's why I decided that the only way to do this is to produce for you something that you can spend the week studying and looking closely at. And uh, so uh, that's why I made this document. Now, it's about 14 pages. A couple of things that I'd like to say going into this I did use English. I used the English Standard Version translation. I think that's a good English translation. Uh, it is from a Christian publisher, but the Hebrew reflects uh, fairly accurately to what you'll find in the Hebrew. Now, to do this exact, to do a very, very good job on this, which I didn't do this week, I didn't have time, would be to bring the Hebrew in and or translate all of this myself to ensure that I capture singulars, plurals, exact translations according to the Hebrew. Uh, but I decided to consistently use a singular translation, and uh, I've noted in my class notes some of the things that may not be exact. So I'll be able to point you in that direction. But if you have not yet downloaded this document, now it shouldn't be difficult this time. Last time it was a little more difficult because some people were saying, well, I'm not on Facebook. You uploaded it to the Facebook group. What I didn't do last week was let people know that I also uploaded the PDF to our website. Now, I think that some may have already posted that document link. But I'm going to do it again right now while I'm thinking about it. I just posted it on the Facebook uh, chat, and now I'm going to post it on the YouTube chat. If someone else has done that, please forgive me for the duplication, but I want to make sure that you have this document. 
I understand also that some people join our class on their phone. Now, this is going to be a bit difficult on your phone, perhaps, uh, but maybe if you turn it sideways, it'll be a little bit easier to follow. Okay, so you will need the handout. Now, if you listen to this later, or if by the time you hear my words, you are listening to the podcast, I will also have uploaded this document to the post that I put on our website, unitedisraelworldunion.com. I'll also load it there. So you'll have the benefit if you listen to it later or if you listen to the class again with all your notes scattered out, you'll also have uh, John Perry's helpful teaching notes as well. So there are pros and cons to producing a document like we have here. And one of those is that if you're listening on the phone, it's a little bit uh, more difficult to follow the small print. But nonetheless, I think that you will see that it is absolutely necessary to have the companion handout, which I've titled, A Comparative Table from Exodus and Deuteronomy, a handout for the class on reading Kiti Sah. Uh, you'll notice if you take a look at this document, uh, you'll notice that I have a brief summary or description of what is to follow, a little bit about what we're talking about. Then I have three columns. On the left is narrative slash notes. Those are my notes, but I also hope that you'll be able to use some of the space to put your own notes in. The middle column is the uh, corresponding text in Exodus 24 and 32. I'll describe why we have two texts from Exodus. And then in the right-hand column, column 3, you'll see that the text there comes from Deuteronomy chapter 9 and 10. So at the outset, I'll tell you that I'm basically comparing the narrative accounts that are supplied for us in Exodus 24 and 32 with the narrative accounts that are given in Deuteronomy chapter 9 and 10. We're using this form, this table, uh, this document to show similarities and differences. Now, I've already stated that the material that I'm drawing this class from comes from Kitisa, but, or at least a part of Kitisa, because I'm not reading and covering the material of the entire portion. But I should also tell you that it covers much more. As this study will make very plain, uh, our story occurs in Kitisa, but it's also told in Torah reading Ekev, which is Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 12, all the way through Deuteronomy 11 verse 25. So if you're listening uh, to this class uh, now, you stick with me. But if you're listening to it later, I would ask you at this point to pause the player, go read Exodus 24, uh, Exodus 32 through 34, and then read Deuteronomy chapter 9 and 10. But don't do that now. Listen to me, please. You can do that later. Uh, so if let's let me make something clear. If we're following the annual cycle, which we are, and a lot of other people in the world are, and you were to read Ki Tisa, and then next week you read the next reading, and next and so forth, all the way, you would not reach the other account of this story until the 20th of August. The 20th of August is 26 weeks from right now. Now, think about that. You're going to read the story of uh, what we're going to talk about today, and then it's going to be six months before you read it again. Now, if it's been six months, and you're not looking at these two accounts side by side, guess what? You're not going to notice the things that we're going to draw out today. It's going to be too far from now. So this reason alone is one of the main reasons that I advocate for people to do uh, comparative studies, horizontal reading, look at the account given in one place, look at the account given in another place, but look at them side by side, even if you have to jot notes in two columns on a page. Sometimes 
we have an account that occurs multiple times, more than two, in the Pentateuch, or sometimes portions of the story are told elsewhere in the Tanakh. I encourage you to pull those together, look at them side by side. But if it's a long time, if you're just following the weekly cycle, uh, it's going to be a long time between these accounts, and you're not going to notice these things. Okay, so to give you some context, to set things up for today, I want to give you a little bit of what's going on in the biblical period that we're looking at. So here we have Kitisa takes place, the events described in Kitisa that I intend to focus on take place after the 10 words have been spoken. And now Moses is about to go up on the mount to receive the tablets. And we pointed out in previous classes that the great event, this great thing Deuteronomy calls it, the speaking of, the communicating of the 10 words from the mountain with smoke and fire and uh, all the different uh, awesome uh, weather events and so forth that are going on, the trumpet getting louder and louder. Um, th this event, this watershed event, uh, has already happened, but remember, God does not give Moses the tablets at that time. Now, today's reading, he's preparing to go up to get those tablets. It's been some time. We'll talk about how long it's been. Now, this is not on the sheet. What I intend to cover now, what I intend to tell you now is not on the sheet because I intend to do another class where I highlight these or at least maybe an article that I post on uh, our website, my website, or academia, or all three. But I want to tell you a couple of points to kind of set the stage before we get into the material. In Exodus 19 and 20, we get the story, we get one version of the story of the what the Jewish people call Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah, Okay. Uh, the 10 words are communicated, and then after Exodus chapter 19 and 20 and the giving of the, uh, the 10 words spoken from the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly, what we then get is several chapters of laws. So after the 10 words, it goes straight into chapter 20, uh, a list of laws, 21, 22, 23, 24. So we've got four chapters, roughly, of legal material that is presented in that place between the giving of the words on uh, the mountain on the day of assembly out of the midst of the fire and Moses going back up to get the tablets, all right? Now, look with me. Uh, because after chapter 24, where it says that Moses goes up, which we'll get to in the sheet in a few moments, but flip that over, in fact, flip, because I know some of you are tempted. You're going to be trying to read all that and not paying attention. Uh, but, so after chapter 24, when Moses goes up, we then have chapter 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, all of which give more laws, more legal material, including uh, details about the Mishkan, the tabernacle, the priesthood, all of this legal material. And, and then that goes all the way up until, go with me to Exodus 31. Exodus 31 and verse 18. Exodus 31, verse 18. Now this, by the way, this follows all of this legal material, basically. And it says, And he gave to Moses, when he had made an end of speaking to him upon Mount Sinai, two tablets of the testimony. You learned about this last week. Tablets of stone written with the finger of God. Okay. So right before that, again, all this legal material, then Moses receives two tablets of the testimony, as it's called in Exodus. Pay attention. The very next thing in the context says, 
And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, they gathered themselves together. And this is where our story begins. But before we begin, before we begin, go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 5. I'm going to show you the same playing out of events in Deuteronomy that we just saw in Exodus with some variation. Deuteronomy 5.19. Now, this is the Hebrew verse division. I think in a, uh, an English Bible, a Christian Bible, I believe it's chapter 5, verse 22. It says, These words Jehovah spoke to all your assembly in the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, in thick darkness, with a great voice that was not heard again. Uh, it, actually, in the Hebrew it says, And he added no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone and delivered them to me. So here we have Moses after the revelation uh, at Sinai, the giving of, or actually Sinai's Exodus's version. After the the spoke the words are spoken, Moses says that he received the tablets, but he didn't receive them exactly at that point. If we look at everything side by side. We know that there's some delays, just giving an overview, if you will. So after chapter 5, we get several chapters, 6, 7, 8. Then in chapter 9, we have Moses going up to receive the two tablets, okay? So you, what we both have, what, what both of these accounts tell us is the following. We begin on common ground between Exodus and Deuteronomy. We have the ten words are communicated to the assembly of the people on the day of assembly out of the midst of the fire um, in the desert. Okay, We have the ten words are spoken. Then Exodus and Deuteronomy both say, here's some other material. Here's some other material. Exodus is very heavy on the legal side. Deuteronomy, not so. Deuteronomy tells us that God added no more. And then he gives some historical things. You know, you have chapter 6, you have the Shema, you have all those wonderful things about the love of God and so forth. Chapter 7, about the chosenness of the people. Chapter 8, etc. Not the lengthy legal sections that we see in Exodus, but nonetheless, there is the communication of the ten words, additional material, followed by Moses going up to get the tablets, okay? Counts a little bit different, but the structure is the same. Now, a couple of other needed data points before we get into the the nitty-gritty of our study. Generally, it is believed and put forward by religious folks, Uh, scholars, sages, just about everybody, maybe except me and a few others who read this really, really closely, they think that Deuteronomy's version, Deuteronomy's account of what we're going to talk about today is a retelling, okay? That uh, it's a retelling of the events, a reworking of the details from the Exodus account. It's supposedly, Deuteronomy's account supposedly takes place 40 years, roughly, 37, 38, 39, uh, roughly four decades after the actual events on the day of assembly, out of the midst of the fire, etc. Most people believe that Exodus's account, or the account in the book of Exodus, is relating sort of an on-the-spot reporting. It's, it's Moses' words, is what some people believe, Moses' words of the events at the time they happened. And therefore, the, uh, the preference for many people is to go with the Exodus account. Because of this, others have noticed differences. So it's you have to establish which came first. This is what a lot of people do, even if they do this subconsciously. So most people believe that Exodus is the earlier account written by Moses at that time. Deuteronomy comes up 
Same story, but it's 40 years later. Maybe Moses is a little bit shady on some of the details is, I guess, what they think. Here's another data point for you to notice and pay close attention. I've been stressing this for several years now. Exodus's version is in the third person. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, etc. You see this all the time. In fact, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers are without exception. Please understand. Third person. Deuteronomy's account contains something that is contained in no other book of the five. A first person account. And the Lord, or Jehovah, spoke unto me, saying, and it only occurs in Deuteronomy. So I want you to pay close attention, not only in this class, but in future classes. And anytime you pick up your Bible, look for, is it third person or is it first person? It's natural for me, and I want to stress this as we get ready to enter into this study, it's natural for me to say, uh, and I prepared my class last night as I studied the biblical text in Exodus and Deuteronomy. I wrote these down. I produced this chart. It's not so natural for me to say, Ross produced a chart for you last night. Ross took the text in Exodus and put them side by side in Deuteronomy in his Apple computer for your study. He did everything he could to not miss a single detail. It's not as natural, is it? What this leads me to believe is that Deuteronomy is at least presented as coming from, at least where it uses the first person, coming from a source which comes from that which was written by Moses himself. Those accounts which are written in the third person, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, would most logically and likely be from the hand of someone else, not Moses. Our worksheet begins with Moses going up. Deuteronomy sets... Uh, the stage, if you will, uh, sets the stage for um, what we're going to be talking about, which I've called the provocation at Horeb. Now, let me read this uh, intro. The Pentateuch contains two accounts of the sin of the molten calf. Notice I said molten. The basic story told in both books says that during Moses' 40-day stay in the mountain to receive the two stone tablets, the people make a molten calf. God told Moses what they had done, instructs him to go down, further threatening to wipe them out and start over with Moses. When Moses sees the corruption of the people, he throws the two stone tablets to the ground, breaking them. He then burns the image that the people have made, throws the dust and ashes in the water. God then commands Moses to cut two new stone tablets and to bring them back up the mountain. The, quote, Ten Commandments, end quote, are written on the second set of stone tablets. Each account provides details that are lacking in the other version. The purpose of this study is to recognize the similarities and differences between these two accounts. So, again... Notice the, the columns, just so you're familiar with it. And what we do is we start off at the top. Uh, Moses says, even at Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath, and the Lord was so angry with you that he was ready to destroy you. Now, the next b block, and again, I'm not going to read the entire um uh, progression here, but I just want you to see that uh, the next block is, I've labeled in the left-hand side, the call to ascend. Exodus reports that the Lord said to Moses, 
Come up to me on the mountain and wait there. Now look at right next to it. Look at Deuteronomy's version. When I went up the mountain. Okay, now notice the bold. I want to show you a couple of things so that when you're studying this on your own, you'll know what I'm trying to do here. The bold shows in English a close uh, connection between the text. Notice I have up in, in uh, Exodus it says, uh, the Lord said to Moses, this is third person, come up to me on the mountain. And then Deuteronomy in Moses' first person said, when I went up the mountain. Now notice the next column, that I may give you, Exodus's version, the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I've written for their instruction. Deuteronomy says to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that the Lord made with you. Now, again, stress should be, attention should be given to the first person account. And both accounts tell the same thing, you see. But one appears to be someone else telling the story that Moses is telling in Deuteronomy 9. You follow? Now, I'm just going to quickly go through some of these things. Notice in my column, the next one down, the next row down says, Deuteronomy has no match. In other words, where it says, so Moses rose with his assistant Joshua and Moses, uh, with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we return to you, and behold, Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Deuteronomy doesn't report that. Now, the the most common response to that is Deuteronomy is retelling the events. It doesn't include all the details. Okay, maybe, but watch as we keep going. I want you to be looking for tendencies of the author or the source that we're looking at. Uh, does one typically expand greatly over the material of the other, or you might view it, you might say, or does one greatly reduce the amount of material uh, and give only sort of, a, as we say, a Reader's Digest version? Is it that simple? Is that what's going on here? Eh, we'll keep going. Now, one other thing I'd like to show you is that if you notice that uh, I have some of this in gray, the reason some of it is in gray, if you see something in gray, it's that something has been pulled into our discussion just to show you uh, agreement in language, agreement in narrative flow. In other words, kitisa, Exodus 24 is not in kitisa, but because I'm comparing the story of kitisa, I need to pull something in from Exodus 24. In this case, it's the story of Moses going up, which is told in Deuteronomy 9, which ties to the narrative that we're looking at. Hopefully, that makes sense. So you'll see the next block, then Moses went up on the mountain. Moses' first person account says, then I went up the mountain to receive the, the tablets of stone, tablets of the covenant that Jehovah made with you. Now, an interesting thing that I want to point out in Exodus is that the Exodus account of Moses going up into the mountain, first of all, he has people with him up to a certain point. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Moses tells us nothing about anybody else with him. He goes alone. He goes alone. He goes up the mountain. He doesn't have Joshua. He doesn't have the elders. They don't eat together with God None of that occurs in Deuteronomy's account, but it does appear in Exodus's account. The other thing that's interesting is that in Exodus's account, the glory of the Lord appears. The cloud comes down on Mount Sinai, you'll see. And then after uh, six days, on the seventh day, Moses is called uh, out of the midst of the cloud and then it tells about the appearance of the glory of the Lord, the Kavod Jehovah, 
uh, was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain. Moses enters the cloud and goes up. Now, what this means is at some point along the way, the elders and Joshua remain. Moses goes on up. So you have the people at the bottom. The el- some of the elders and Joshua go up a part way, and then Moses goes into the cloud, goes up alone. That's Exodus's version. I want to point out that the glory of the Lord, the Kavod Yehovah, appears numerous times in the five books. I shouldn't say the five books. I should say in the collection of books that we call the Pentateuch, it occurs in Exodus. It occurs in Leviticus. It occurs in Numbers. It never occurs in Deuteronomy. Now, why is that? Okay, we'll talk about that another point. But I gave you some of the references to look up for Kavod Jehovah. Now, as we work our way through, it says Moses was on the mountain uh, 40 days and 40 nights. Now notice the next block is in gray, which means that according to Exodus, Moses is on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. This is going up to get the tablets the first time. But it doesn't say anything at this point about Moses fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. It does say that later in Exodus, which I have pulled up for agreement, because in Deuteronomy's version, first trip up, I mean, to get the first set of tablets, Moses says, I remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. That's where Exodus stops. Deuteronomy continues, I, first person, neither ate bread nor drank water. You see that? Now, don't be confused. I've got that in gray on the Exodus column, but that's because later there's a fast. Notice my note. The fast of 40 days and 40 nights occurs in Exodus at another point. It's been pulled forward to show verbal agreement with Deuteronomy 10. Exodus does not report a 40-day fast when Moses went up to receive the first set of tablets. So Moses continues in Deuteronomy that God gave him the two tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. Uh, The same words are on the stones, first set, that God spoke to the people uh, on the mountain out of the midst of the fire on the day of assembly. Mountain, by the way, is not named. Stay with me. Okay. Now, then Moses, according to our narrative flow, comparing everything that we have, first set, Moses goes up, He is on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights, at least according to Deuteronomy, neither eats nor drinks. And he's given at the end of that 40 days two tablets written by God that contain the words spoken on the day of assembly. Exodus then tells us something that Deuteronomy doesn't have, and that is that the people feel that Moses is coming back. His return is delayed. Deuteronomy doesn't mention any delay, doesn't mention that the people go to Aaron. Exodus tells us that the people gather themselves to Aaron and they say, look, we don't know. I'm paraphrasing. It's there for you to read later. Uh, We don't know what happened to this guy, Moses. You know, he's gone. He's been gone. It seems like forever. And we don't know where he's at. Hey, how about this, Aaron? How about you make us a God? You know, I mean, that that way we can pass some time. You make us a God. Aaron, for his part, jumps right in. By the way, again, only in Exodus. Uh, Everybody give me your earrings, your jewelry. And and Aaron fashions the jewelry into a molten image. Okay? Uh, I want to bring up, you'll see this as we work through, but in verse 4 of Exodus 32... He received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. Listen, stop calling it a golden calf. I know it's in the Sunday school books. Uh, it, It may somehow be that people have gotten this idea from the pictures that they've seen. Um, it is a calf. It is molten, 
Uh, and we'll talk about the gold in a little bit, but if you're telling the story, this is the translator's fault. It doesn't say a golden calf here. Golden is not used. It's a molten calf. It's something you know, like you melt something down, you pour it in there, uh, but it doesn't say golden at this point. So why put golden? I don't know, but let's be accurate with the text here. Uh, by the way, the next thing is that Aaron uh, and they said, after Aaron makes this uh, molten image, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron saw this. He then builds an altar. And then he declares the next day a festival to Jehovah. They rose up early in the morning, offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings. The people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to play. Deuteronomy doesn't have that story. Now, meanwhile, back on the mountain. This is down below. Whatever's going on down below, now I want you to go back up the mountain. The Lord, Jehovah, says to Moses, notice again, Exodus, the Lord said to Moses, Deuteronomy, the Lord said to me. You'll see I have, I just want to show you how I tried to get as close as possible uh, Deuteronomy's version, Moses says that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down quickly from here. For your people whom you have brought from Egypt have acted corruptly. Exodus's version is a little bit different, slightly different. No word arise. It does say go down. doesn't say go down quickly. From your, for your people whom you brought. Almost a perfect agreement between in fact, in the Hebrew, I think it is precisely the same wording. Uh, a little bit different, but the idea is both accounts. One is presented as a first-person account. The Lord spoke unto me, saying, uh, the other is an account someone else wrote about what is written from the same source, I presume, that the writer of Deuteronomy has gotten his from, or hers. They have turned aside quickly out of the way, that I commanded them, they have made for themselves. Notice, perfect agreement. Those two, two passages, like if you look at the English and the Hebrew in Exodus and Deuteronomy right there, that last block that's all bold, there it is. Perfect agreement between the two. Now, Exodus says, they have made for themselves a golden calf, and then... In uh, Deuteronomy's, the English, the English I'm talking, has a metal image. Now look at my note. In both accounts, a molten image is made. I give the Hebrew. Here at this point, only Exodus tells us the images of a calf. Ein Gimel Lamed. Now in Deuteronomy 9.16, we're not there yet. Where it agrees with Exodus here, you'll see the same language. Nowhere in the text does the Hebrew say that they made a golden calf. Now, here's the, the kicker. The closest association is Exodus 32, 31, which we'll get to shortly. Now, Exodus's version continues. In Exodus, it says, uh, God, this is according to Exodus's version. God tells Moses that the people have worshipped it, sacrificed to it, and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy's version doesn't have that. Now, this, I want to show you how English translations take liberties or they're not consistent. Now, some of this you, you know because you followed Dr. Tabor's work like he's published his book of Genesis, where he gets as literal as you can in this transparent version where you can look at the English, and if you translate a phrase one way from Hebrew into English, he consistently does that throughout. Don't think that a lot of translations do this. They don't. Here's an example. Exodus, middle column. And the Lord said to Moses, I've seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Deuteronomy's version, right-hand column, Furthermore, the Lord said to me, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stubborn people. 
Now, if you're reading in an English Bible, you might not know that the Hebrew is exactly the same. Exactly the same. So why is it that Deuteronomy 9.13 translates it different than Exodus 32.9? I don't know. Maybe a different editor was assigned or a different translator was assigned this particular passage. But the Hebrew, uh, English, uh, the Hebrew behind the English in Exodus and Deuteronomy, where Exodus has stiff-necked people and Deuteronomy has stubborn, same Hebrew phrase. And I have it there for you. Uh, God then is angered, says, let me alone. I'm going to skip through this. You'll see the similarities and differences. Ultimately, what happens here is God says, let me be. I'm going to wipe them out and start over with you, Moses. I'm going to make you a great nation. Very similar to what he tells Abraham uh, in Genesis 12 and elsewhere. I'll make of you a great nation, and so forth and so on. And so when this uh, threat by Jehovah is presented to Moses, according to Exodus' account, Moses goes into uh, an intercession on behalf of the people. He falls on his face, basically, and and he says to God, uh, how how is this going to work if, you know, when, when they're... When you destroy them, people are going to look from the outside and they're going to say, he brought them out here to kill them. And so he he appeals to God's mercy and nature. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants. Uh, Remember what you said. And then in verse 14, and Jehovah relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. By the way, uh, that is not reported in Deuteronomy. And you, you, can, you, know, you can have your own reason as to why. I just want to make this point. In Deuteronomy, God does say, leave me alone. I want to wipe this people out. Deuteronomy says, and Moses says, so I turned and came down from the mountain. The mountain was burning with fire, and I had the two tablets in my hand. Exodus has this long report of an intercession, uh, presumably that happens right as soon as God says he's going to wipe them out, Uh, but it's not in Deuteronomy. Both accounts have Moses going now down the mountain. Exodus is third person. Deuteronomy is first person. In both accounts, Moses has the tablets with him, but here's an interesting point. Exodus says, with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand. Deuteronomy says, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. Okay, let me talk about this for a minute. First thing I want to bring up, and you might think it's a minor point, but we're going to see it in another place. In Exodus's version, um, Moses has both tablets in one hand. Now, you, you think, well, how big were they? Well, how big do they have to be? You can look at some of the ancient tablets, such as those discovered in Byblos or Sumeria, uh, and some of these tablets are pretty small. You know, I don't think they have to be these big, huge, huge chunks of three-inch marble that you might see in your local synagogue that are 10 feet tall. No, they're It says in Exodus that he has them in his hand. The Hebrew is singular there. Now, Deuteronomy on the, (coughs) excuse me, Deuteronomy on the other hand has the tablets in his two hands. It's there the dual form is used. So there you get a picture of Moses carrying them in his two hands. Still doesn't give away any dimensions. We don't know how big they are by either of these. You know, you might say, well, he's got them in both in one hand. I think that they were probably relatively small. Um, but he could have had one, if he has them in both hands, he could have had one in the palm of each of his hands, you know, running down the mountain. I don't know. The other thing I want to point out here is that um, the other thing I want to point out is that that Exodus refers to the two tablets of the testimony 
The testimony means something specific. You got a great class on that last week with Dr. Tabor. It's something very specific. In fact, the testimony is the tablets. It's the name given to the tablets that are put into the box of the testimony, that then are put into the tent of the testimony, that are then, you see, the testimony, the testimony, the testimony. It's mentioned, testimony is mentioned in Exodus. It's mentioned in Leviticus. It's mentioned in Numbers. But it is not mentioned in Deuteronomy. They're not called the testimony in Deuteronomy. There are two references to Ha'edut in uh, Deuteronomy, and that's in Deuteronomy 4.45 and Deuteronomy 6 verse 20. But in those passages, write them down, go look them up. It's plural, testimonies, but it's not something specific like it's used in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. This is all going to make sense in a little bit. Exodus says the two tablets uh, of the testimony in his hand, one hand. Deuteronomy says, first person, that Moses says, I turned, went down from the mountain, mountains of burning with fire, which is a theme found throughout Deuteronomy about the fire. And the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. All right. Now, Exodus goes on and describes the tablets, says that they're written on both sides, on the front and the back. Uh, they were written, the tablets were the work of God, the writing was the writing of God, engraved on the tablets. Now, I did want to put a, I put this in my note column. If you want to see, uh, it's interesting, Exodus and Deuteronomy both report very clearly that the words on these tablets are written with the finger of God. And I put C, Exodus 31, 18 and Deuteronomy 9, 10. Okay, so he's on his way down. He's got the two tablets either in one hand or in both hands, and he's coming down the mountain. And he presumably, where he left Joshua, he meets up with Joshua again. Now they're going together in Exodus's account. Deuteronomy does not mention Joshua going up nor coming down. And since he doesn't mention in Deuteronomy that, that Joshua went up a part way with him, he has no reason to pick him up on the way back down. But in Exodus's account, Joshua hears the noise of the people. You remember this story. Uh, it's not, uh, the, there's a noise of war in the camp. It's not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And he comes near the camp Exodus account says he saw the calf and the dancing and Moses' anger burns hot. Deuteronomy's version says, and I looked and behold, you had sinned against Jehovah your God. You had made yourselves a golden calf. It's not golden calf, it's molten. Now, I know some of you are thinking of gods of gold and you're going to say, ah, that's the answer there. Ross doesn't know that verse. Stick with me. Comes down. He sees them. They're frolicking, my word, not Moses's, around this image, this molten image that you made. And it says he's so angered that he, uh, Exodus tells us that he's angry anyway. He's clearly angry. He throws the tablets. Now notice in Exodus' account, threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them. Uh, and then Deuteronomy says, threw them out of my two hands and broke them. You go, ah, well, there's the plural. Nope. In Hebrew, Exodus's account in 32, 19 says he threw the tablets out of his hand, singular. Uh, Deuteronomy has the dual there, out of my two hands. So either way. One hand, two hands, he's got the tablets in a hand or both hands. He throws them down, according to both accounts, at the foot of the mountain, according to Exodus, before your eyes, Deuteronomy. Some of these differences, it, it's okay. I'm not suggesting that this indicates uh, anything other than different accounts, so, so don't get nervous. 
he, he clearly, he's in front of some of them, obviously, and he throws them down in front of them. He's at the base of the mountain, and, uh, and then it says, according to Deuteronomy, that he uh, prostrates himself. He, he gets down on his face before the Lord as before 40 days and 40 nights, he says. I, first person, neither ate bread nor drank water because of all the sin that you had committed in doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Exodus has an intercession earlier where Deuteronomy doesn't. Here, Deuteronomy has an intercession where Exodus doesn't. And by the way, this, according to Deuteronomy's account, is the second fast of 40 days and 40 nights. It is clearly not the same one mentioned previously. Here, he fasts again 40 days and 40 nights. You'll see my note there. And the reason he fasts, according to Deuteronomy, uh, is because he's fearful of what God's going to do to these rebellious people. He says that, for I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure that Jehovah bore against you so that he was ready to destroy you. Now remember, God, according to Deuteronomy, had already said he's going to destroy them. So Moses beats feet down the mountain. He sees for himself, then he goes into intercession. Exodus' account, God tells tells Moses what's going on. He intercedes for them then, then he goes down. You see the the difference in the two reports, the two accounts. Now, Exodus' account earlier gave us a very detailed report of Aaron's sin and his involvement in what was this great sin. Deuteronomy doesn't talk about it a lot. In Deuteronomy's version, look what it says, And the Lord was so angry with Aaron that he was ready to destroy him, and I prayed for Aaron also at that time. So Aaron's sin is described in great detail in Exodus. But here in Deuteronomy, it says that he, we know he did something bad. We know that his involvement was, he was implicit in what happened, so God's ready to kill him. Uh, but it doesn't give us any of the detail that we read. There's no account of the people saying, hey, this Moses, we don't know where he's at. His de- coming is delayed. Let's make a calf. Aaron says, okay. So then he throws the earrings in, you know, the story. Uh, Deuteronomy doesn't have any of that. Now, here's another point I want to make. There are teachings out there that say that Aaron is, poor Aaron is just innocent in all this that really it's that mixed multitude. You know those dirty, nasty Gentiles that came out of Egypt with the Jews? This mixed multitude, they they kind of, they were the ones that are the guilty ones. Well, not according to the text and not according to God. Aaron is the problem. Now, why would a document uh, purporting to be the history of ancient Israel start us off with one of the first things that the high priest does is bad. I don't know. Let's keep studying. Um, Now, in both accounts, we have Moses taking the calf that they made. He burns it in fire. Notice the differences. Uh, Exodus 32, he took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire. Uh, Deuteronomy uh, verse 21 there, then I took, notice, the sinful thing, the calf that you had made and burned it with fire. Notice, burned it with fire is very consistent. He takes the calf, Deuteronomy says that sinful thing, you know that calf, and and he he burns it with fire, uh, and then he grinds it to powder. Notice Deuteronomy gives us a little bit more detail, but the, the grinding of it, different form of the word, but it's still there. And then he scatters it on the water. Now, Exodus says he scatters it on the water. Deuteronomy says that there's a brook that ran down from the mountain. All right. Exodus doesn't tell us that. It just says there's some water, but it could be the same brook that Deuteronomy is talking about. Moses throws the ashes and the fine powdered of that dirty, nasty, sinful thing that Aaron made on the water 
Exodus says, and then he made them drink it. Deuteronomy doesn't know that, or at least doesn't tell us that. Now, the rabbis will later make a big story out of this. They'll say, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the waters of the Sota. In Numbers chapter 5, there's this story where if you, if a man believes that his woman has uh, committed adultery, he brings her to the high priest, the high priest scoops up some dirt of the floor of the tabernacle, mixes it with some water, has her drink it, and if her uh, bowels explode, then she's guilty. Uh, that's in the book of Numbers. I've often said that if uh, you accuse your woman of committing adultery and somehow you convince her to go see the priest and drink that dirt water, that ride home is going to be very uncomfortable if she didn't have her guts explode. I'm telling you, that's going to be a bad ride home. So, but they compare it to the Sota. Again, Exodus puts a great deal of emphasis on the sin of Aaron. Notice, uh, here, Moses challenges Aaron, and Aaron lies and says that, look, I, I, you know how these people are. Moses, Moses, you know how they are. I just, I, I mean, they put a lot of pressure on me. I threw in the gold and out popped this calf. Deuteronomy doesn't know anything about that. Deuteronomy's version passes by Aaron's guilt very simply. God wanted to kill him. Now, after the grinding and throwing it on the water, according to Exodus's version, Exodus's version, it says that Moses sees, you know, how all this stuff has gone and how bad things are, and he says, "Who's on the Lord's side?" And that people divvy divided up, and then the Levites strap on swords and go through the camp and kill 3,000 brothers, companions, neighbors. Deuteronomy doesn't have anything about that. Because of their zeal and the slaughter of their friends, neighbors, and companions, and brothers for their participation in this idolatrous uh, activity, the Levites, according to Exodus, are, are placed in a ministerial role. Uh, notice verse 29 of uh, Exodus 32. And Moses said, Today you've been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. According to Exodus, this uh, slaughter of the 3,000 earns the Levites their ministerial role. Deuteronomy also, in this context, mentions the Levites being placed in a certain position. But it reads considerably different. Look at 10.8. At that time, Jehovah set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant of Jehovah, to stand before Jehovah to minister to him, and to bless in his name to this day. Therefore, Levi has no portion or inheritance with his brothers. Jehovah is his inheritance, as Jehovah your God said to him. Two different reasons for Levi being placed in a ministerial position. Think about that. After uh, this event, according to Exodus, the slaughter of the, uh, the people, the 3,000, Moses tells the people, those minus the 3,000, those still living, that, um, that they've committed a great sin. I guess that the, the ones who died were not the only ones who committed the sin, and those who committed the sin didn't all die because he tells them, you've committed a great sin. Now he's going to try to make atonement for them. So he goes, he says he's going he's gonna to go to God. So he asks God, either forgive the people their sin or just take me out of your book. And God tells him, uh, we don't do things like that. Whoever, verse 33 the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I'll blot him out of my book. But now go lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. And then uh, verse 35, another plague comes according to Exodus 
uh, because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. Again, Deuteronomy doesn't have anything about uh, the slaughter of the 3,000, about the following day and the plague and none of that. Now, now we pick back up where they agree. Moses uh, is told by the Lord, cut for yourselves two tablets of stone like the first. Notice Exodus 34, 1, the Lord said to Moses, cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first. Deuteronomy 1, at that time, Jehovah said to me, first person, cut for yourselves two tablets of stone like the first. Perfect agreement in the language. One is recorded first person, the other is another third person report. Both of these accounts agree. Both say that God will write the words on the new set of tablets, the same words that were on the first set. You see it? And then it goes on. I'm going to pick up my speed a little bit. Be ready for the next, uh, the next morning, according to Exodus. Go up to the mountain. Now, I want you to notice um, that in Exodus, it calls in the morning to Mount Sinai. Deuteronomy says to me on the mountain. Check me on this. Pay attention. Exodus, everything that we're talking about, sometimes Exodus will name the mountain... Sinai. Deuteronomy never names the mountain. I know some of you are saying, wait, you said Horeb. Stick with me. Is Horeb the name of the mountain? More on that in a minute. Um, now, notice in, De in Exodus's version, hey, you're going to make two tablets of stone like the first ones, I'm going to write on the same words that were on the first ones that you broke. All that's perfectly in agreement. And then he says in Exodus, present yourself to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come with you. Don't let anybody through. It's not necessary to say that in Deuteronomy because in Deuteronomy's account, he doesn't have anybody with him and he didn't last time. He knows that already. Exodus is saying, last time you brought people, this time don't bring them. Notice next that in Deuteronomy, he says, God tells him, come up to me on the mountain and make an ark of wood. Moses is told to make an ark of wood. Exodus doesn't have anything about that. In Exodus's account, Bethsalel and Aholiab are the makers of the ark. And again, he says, I'll write on the tablets the same words that were on the, the uh, first set that you broke. And Deuteronomy says, and you shall put them in the ark. Look at the next verse. So I made an ark of acacia wood. You see how Exodus doesn't report this? Why is that? Exodus has someone else make the ark. Now, uh, James Tabor pointed this out in his article, The Other Ark of the Covenant. You, we've talked about it in cl past classes. We've posted that link. It's what turned me on to this idea years ago when I first uh, got that idea from him. But I've looked at it, continually looked at it. One thought is that Moses makes a little ark. You put the tablets in the little ark, put it in the bigger ark. That's one view. One view is that we have two different stories about the ark. Exodus never mentions Moses making an ark. Deuteronomy never mentions uh, Bezalel and Aholiab making an ark. So is it just that these two different tradition strands preserve different elements and that they're both right, the apologists will seek to put that forward. They'll say, no, yep, Moses made one because it says it in Deuteronomy. And yes, Bezalel and Aholiab made one because it says it everywhere else. And then Moses went into the one that Bezalel and Aholiab made. But is that what we see here? Okay. Now, interestingly enough, we've had two accounts We've had two uh, pericopes, two sayings, two verses, if you will, where it describes the, the tablets in the hand or hands of Moses. Now, here for the first time, Deuteronomy has singular hand in agreement with uh, Exodus. So now, for the first time, we have... Uh, a reference in Deuteronomy 2 that you could carry both tablets in one hand. Now, by the way, these tablets don't have to be small to do this. These two books 
Well, this is a perfect example, Ross. They're exactly the same book, and they're the same size. I could put two tablets, see I got one, two, in the same hand, and I could do it like this, or I could do it like this. Exodus says Moses did this. Deuteronomy two times says Moses did this, had two tablets in two of his hands using the dual of the Hebrew. Here, finally, Moses uh, in Deuteronomy says Moses had him in his hand. Okay? You get that illustration? Good example. Thank you. Now, imagine Moses goes up. He's been told, come up. Deuteronomy, by the way, bring that ark you're going to make with you. Uh, and come up with the two tablets that you make and bring the ark that you make. Come up here. Exodus now tells us that there's an encounter that Deuteronomy doesn't have, where Jehovah descends, uh, he passes by and proclaims, Jehovah, Jehovah, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, faithfulness, uh, keeping steadfast love for thousands. You know this. This Self-description of God is one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture, and it is repeated in one form or another numerous places throughout the biblical narratives, and not only in the five books, but in the prophets and in the writings. Uh, you have other examples. I, I list some of those here. Uh, Exodus continues that Moses bows quickly and, uh, and, and he asked the Lord to go with them in the midst of them. Deuteronomy has no record of this, but notice Exodus continues and covers a lot here that Deuteronomy doesn't have. Um, in Ex uh, Exodus 34.10, And he said, Behold, I am making a covenant. I'm on page 11. Before all your people... I will do marvels I've not created, uh, that such as have not been created in all the earth, and all the people among whom you are shall see the work of God, for it's an awesome thing. Then I have in my note at 3411, what is this material? We, we had Moses, remember Moses, both accounts say, Moses, come up here with the two tablets you make, and I'm going to write on them the same words I wrote on the first one. Now we have God meeting Moses, and then there are a whole list of laws. Uh, a story. I'm going to drive out these uh, inhabitants. <clears throat> Next page. You shall not make for yourself any gods of cast metal. Elohe uh, maska. Here, here we have the molten gods. But notice it's plural. The, the gods uh, that are molten, basically. And then it continues. Hear about all the festivals, and you're going to keep these festivals. Chapter 34, verse 21 and following. Uh, more about the festivals. 34, 25, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leaven. Uh, Passover, first fruits. And then verse 34, 27 says, and Jehovah said to Moses, write these words, for in accordance with these words, I've made a covenant with you and with Israel. Remember, he's up there to get the 10 words that were written on the first tablet. Now he's got some more, and, and this clearly is something that Moses is to write. Now this has led some scholars to propose that this chapter contains another tradition of the second set of words. That the first set was pure, basically, ethical monotheism and such, and this is more of another set of ten words. And various people have proposed a certain counting uh, where people go through and they go, look, there are ten. I don't know. I've tried it, and I come up with different numbers each time I count. But it's about ten. You know, you could put it in ten. But that's one theory. But the question is, he says, write these words for I'm going to make a covenant with you. Well, the words with which the covenant is made 
In fact, Deuteronomy calls them the words of the covenant, the ten words that God spoke from the mountain, on the mount, on the day of assembly, from the midst of the fire, and he wrote them on tablets. That's the words of the covenant. Now, so he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He ate, neither ate bread nor drank water. This is the only reference to a 40-day fast in Exodus, and it's at the second set of tablets, not the first. Deuteronomy has two fasts, one each time. And then, it, look, it says, and he wrote on the tablets. Now, it's kind of unclear if you're just reading who wrote on the tablets in Exodus, the words of the covenant. Well, is it the words of the covenant described in verse 27, following what we just read in chapter 34, all of those different laws? Is that what's written? We don't know. We say, it, it says the Ten Commandments, or in Hebrew, the Aseret HaDevarim, the Ten Words. But is that the Ten Words that I think are the Ten Words? Deuteronomy takes all the ambiguity out. Deuteronomy says, uh, and he wrote on the tablets, clearly talking about Jehovah, in the same writing as before, the Ten Commandments, that Jehovah had spoken to you on the mountain out of the midst of the fire on the day of assembly, and Jehovah gave them to me. Then he comes down the mountain with the two tablets of testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, only called testimony in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Deuteronomy says, and he put the tablets in the ark, uh, or and I, let me back up verse 5, I turned, came down from the mountain, put the tablets in the ark that I had made, and they are there as Jehovah commanded me. Remember, Exodus doesn't know about Moses' ark, so Exodus' account doesn't have anything about that. And then Exodus closes out the story, uh, closes out the story with this interesting um, account, basically, uh, of Moses' face shining. And that is not contained in Deuteronomy. Okay, a few observations. Observations that I noted on my sheet, but I want to pull out for you as I close today. The mountain is called Sinai five times in the material we covered in Exodus's account, but in um, Deuteronomy it's called the mount or the mountain. Never is it called Sinai. Okay? Now, Deuteronomy 9 8 says Horeb, but it's not necessarily clear if Horeb is a mountain. In fact, 17 times, nine of which occur in Deuteronomy, uh, we have the word Horeb, but it is never called Mount Horeb. In fact, every occurrence of Horeb appears to describe a place <clears throat> that the mountain is in, Exodus chapter 3, that Moses goes to Har Ha Elohim, the mountain of God, and in your Bible it's going to say Horeb, the mountain of God. But in Hebrew it says that Moses finds himself at the mountain of God, Horeba, towards Horeb, towards a place called Horeb. Anyway, it's another class. Horeb is not the name of a mountain, it is a place. If you look at Exodus 33, 6, if somebody thinks, well, it does say Mount Horeb there. No, it doesn't. Not in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it says its mountain is in uh, the construct state. So it's the mountain of Horeb, the region, uh, and so forth. Now, Another point, Exodus describes a group going up but not fully. Only Moses goes into the cloud. Deuteronomy has no match. Exodus has the glory of the Lord. No appearance in Deuteronomy of the glory of the Lord. Deuteronomy has Moses fast 40 days and nights for the first set of tablets. Exodus doesn't. Deuteronomy has two 40-day fasts. Exodus's only 40-day fast is Exodus 34:28. Exodus reports that a delay on the part of Moses returning is what prompts the people to ask Aaron to build a god. All of that narrative 
is lacking in Deuteronomy's account. Deuteronomy doesn't mention the delay on the part of Moses, nor any direct narrative about Aaron and the people requesting such of Aaron. By the way, again, mark this down. There's no mention anywhere of a golden calf. We do have one passage that says that the people made gods of gold. But is that what's being described as the sinful thing? The molten thing that they made? Is that what it's called? Because it is plural, the gods of gold. Did the people along around this big bonfire, were they making gods too? Don't know. But pay attention to singulars and plurals. Exodus alone, Exodus alone reports that the people worshipped and sacrificed to the image and called it the Elohim who brought them out of the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy uh, doesn't have that. Exodus then has a long intercessory prayer that Deuteronomy doesn't have. Two of three times, when it talks about Moses packing the tablets, uh, two of three times, Exodus has two tablets in one hand. Deuteronomy has uh, two hands. Exodus calls the two tablets the testimony. So does Leviticus and Numbers, but Deuteronomy never, ever calls them the tablets of the testimony. Exodus has Joshua coming down with Moses. Deuteronomy doesn't. Only Exodus has him going up halfway, so Exodus has to have him get picked up on the way back. After Moses sees the great sin, he comes down, he sees the sin, says that he fasts 40 days and 40 nights. Exodus doesn't. The image is burned, ground, thrown upon water. Exodus says that Moses had them drink it. Remember the waters of the Sota? Deuteronomy doesn't mention that. In Exodus, Moses confronts Aaron. Deuteronomy, Moses prays for him. Exodus. Levites kill 3,000 brothers, companions, and neighbors. And by the, as a reward for this, they're put in a ministerial position. In Deuteronomy, uh, they're put in a ministerial position in context, but it's not associated uh, with the slaughter of 3,000, and that's not mentioned in Deuteronomy. <clears throat> Exodus has the story of another plague. Deuteronomy doesn't. <clears throat> Exodus 34, Moses told to come alone this time. Deuteronomy has no match. He was alone the first time and the second. Deuteronomy has Moses commanded to make an ark. No mention of Bezalel or Aholiab is in Exodus. Exodus 34, Jehovah comes down and proclaims the name and his character, followed by more laws called the covenant. A little bit of ambiguity there not present in Deuteronomy. Exodus reports Moses' face shining and that he has to wear a veil from that day forward. Deuteronomy doesn't have that. The Pentateuch, in closing, has two accounts of the sin of the molten calf and the two tablets, or the two sets of two tablets, I should say. They are clearly from different sources, I believe, different hands, different times. But it's by recognizing these different strands and the tendencies of the authors who penned them that we are fortunately placed in a much better position to find what I call the hand of Moses. What did Moses write? Can we determine with any degree of certainty any part of this story that goes back to the earliest strata? I believe we can. Next week, we continue our new look at the Pentateuch. Don't miss it. Join me next week. Shabbat Shalom. Shavuot Tov. Have a blessed week.